So today we're going to talk about conservation of energy. And you might be like, hey, wait a second, Professor Landon. We just talked about conservation of energy last time in the form of the Bernoulli equation. And I'd say, yes, but remember, that form, that Bernoulli equation was pretty limited in its assumptions, right? It involved basically the assumption of nothing that dissipated or lost energy in some way. And we know that dissipation of energy occurs all the time in fluid mechanics. So what are we going to do? We're going to talk about conservation of energy. We're going to build towards a more elaborate version of conservation of energy than the Bernoulli equation. Um, but we're going to start with the context of the Bernoulli equation. So we're basically going to modify the Bernoulli equation, reformulate it a little bit into a per unit mass form. So we're going to talk about the per, the per unit mass form of the Bernoulli equation. Um, and uh, and then we're also going to talk about the limitations. The limitations of the Bernoulli equation in its current form. And the need for a more uh, elaborate and, and widely useful uh, conservation of energy formulation for fluid mechanics. Then uh, I'm going to give you that form. So in my lecture notes online, I have a very complicated derivation of, of, this, uh, of this modified form of conservation of energy, but I'm going to mostly skip that in this lecture and instead just give it and talk about what the various terms mean and how they're useful. So I'm going to talk about um, isothermal steady state, single inlet, and single outlet. conservation of energy. And uh, and most particularly, this this form that we'll have here will involve a term that involves that that incorporates turbulence, viscous losses, friction in some sense, right? So this is actually going to be a form that doesn't involve um, the assumption of nothing that loses energy in the way that Bernoulli does. Um, and this form, this new form of conservation of energy is going to involve a couple of tweaks. So um, this, uh, and, and I'll explain them in the next couple of steps. So it's basically going to need a modification It's going to need a modification for non-uniform velocity profiles. Right, if you recall, Bernoulli was defined sort of for a single streamline, and we assumed that single streamline was kind of doing the same um, across an entire inlet or outlet. This version of conservation of energy is going to allow for the analysis of non-uniform velocity profiles. The second thing that this new version of conservation of energy is going to involve um, is the addition of uh, what's called shaft work, which really comes from like mechanical engineering or civil engineering, when you would have like a hydraulic system with some shaft coming out where that shaft would be like spinning a pump, uh, inputting energy into the system or extracting energy from the system by having the fluid spin a turbine, right? So you can think about this as pumps. pumps and turbines. Um, and, and we'll have it, we'll, we'll, so there will be a new term to this conservation of energy that involves the addition of shaft work, pumps and turbines. Um, we'll also make an addition to this, uh, this equation of uh, what I'll call the viscous loss term. which basically is going to involve things like how turbulence can dissipate energy, um, how fluid has a viscous behavior, and that viscosity of the fluid um, kind of leaches energy from the system. Turbulence, viscosity. And es essentially, you know, if, if you were to go back to mechanics, you know, things that sort of would, been, would have been lumped into friction as mechanics, this is going to be the analogous form in fluid mechanics. So we'll call this like friction 
that's like a friction-like term. And then the last thing we'll do is we'll sort of elaborate exactly what um, what these terms are. We'll we'll include sort of two new terms that kind of get at this essence here. We'll we'll actually give a formula for this viscous loss term. Formula for this viscous loss term, um, as well. Uh, and this formula will incorporate the friction factor. So these, these two things, the viscous losses and the friction factor, are two, two separate entities closely related to one another and both used to help um, get at this effect of turbulence, viscosity, friction, and how those things um, contribute to or, in a sense, take away from conservation of energy and fluid mechanics. So let's get started. All right, so let's recap. Bernoulli as we formulated it last time. So last time Bernoulli was this. Uh, we defined it for a streamline. You know, we basically had some flow, and we just said, hey, let's define two points in the flow. Let's say point one, point two, and you know, fluid is moving along at some point, and we basically said, hey, at point one, there's some pressure, some velocity, and some height. Um, and at point two, there's some pressure, some velocity, and some height. And the pressures, velocities, and heights are related to one another through Bernoulli. Which is basically pressure at point one plus one half rho times the magnitude of velocity at point one squared plus rho g, the height at point one above some, you know, some z equals zero level down here is equal to those three quantities but at point two as well. So the pressure at point two plus one half rho v2 squared plus rho g h2. And we said, hey, um, you know, what, what were the units of each of these things? So take a moment now, pause and ponder or look back in your notes. Units. What are the units of each of these terms? All right, so hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder. If you look back at the units of these terms, well, of course, pressures, pressures are going to be in pascals or newtons per meter squared. But if you look at each of these things, it's like a kilograms per meter cubed times meters squared per second squared, which uh, you, can, you can sort of rearrange some stuff here and you could interpret it as a joule per meter cubed, right? Where a joule is a newton meter, right? And in this sense, all of the terms in this equation are energy per unit volume. So the way the way Bernoulli is formulated is in a sense it's conservation of energy, where these where this term is the kinetic energy. This is the kinetic energy. This term right here is the potential. And what causes a change in kinetic energy plus potential energy? Well, the, the thing that causes a change in potential energy and kinetic energy is the work, the work done. And of course, work in the mechanical energy, energy sense is force times distance. But in a fluid sense, you know, the thing that's essentially doing work on fluid is pressure, right? Pressure is essentially a force per area. So it's basically the pressure that's doing work on a little chunk of fluid as it moves from one place to another pressure does work on that fluid, and the work that that pressure does causes a change in its kinetic and potential energy. And of course, the if you have a system where you assume that there's no energy, no energy loss, basically all of the work that goes into pushing something from one point to the other is accounted for by a change in the and the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of this of the uh, of the fluid from one, from one point to the other. So basically, if we assume no energy losses, then energy is conserved in terms of the work done purely changing the the kinetic and potential energy of that fluid. However, what is the main? So so this is so you know conservation of energy. Um, if we think about you know, this form of it is in terms of energy per unit volume, we could equally form energy, uh, we equally form Bernoulli 
as an energy per unit mass of uh, of fluid, right? This is like an energy per unit volume chunk of fluid. If we, we could equally form this as energy per unit mass if we just divided everything by density, right? So if we took all these terms, divided them by density, you know, we could we could equally um, we could equally form Bernoulli as energy per unit mass. And just for convenience sake, rather than think, rather than viewing this as like an inputs, all the inputs on one side and all the outputs on the other, um, I can sort of uh, I can just sort of regroup the the kinetic energy terms together, the potential energy terms together, and the pressure terms together. So I can regroup Bernoulli energy per unit mass by dividing everything by density and group the the same types of terms together. So um, if we do that, what do we get? Well, we get the following. Let's just put zero on one side of the equation. Um, and then I could, on the other side, I could basically just do one half magnitude of V1 squared minus uh, magnitude of V2 squared plus G times H1 minus H2 plus 1 over rho times p1 minus p2. Uh, so I could reformulate Bernoulli as energy per unit mass, and you could, and you could check each of these things, right? Um, you know, energy per unit mass is basically going to be, well, energy is joules and mass is kilograms, but I could equally formulate a joule as a newton meter and kilogram be down here and I could equally formulate a newton as a kilogram meter per second squared per kilogram or sorry a newton a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared per kilograms and then meters in the top so what is this energy per unit mass energy per unit mass is going to have units of meters squared per second squared so what does that mean all of the terms in this equation basically have to have units of meters squared per second squared. And if you and if you check it out, yes, velocity squared should have meters squared per second squared. G, which has uh, meters per second squared, times H, which would have meters, would be meters squared per second squared. And if you work it out, pressure divided by density also has units of meters squared per second squared. So we can, you know, we can just do a, a little bit of algebra on Bernoulli and you know formulate it just as easily as energy per unit mass in this form here and it turns out that this uh, that this formulation is going to be most similar to this formulation of a more elaborate version of conservation of energy that I'm going to talk about in just a sec so this formulation would work great for us in uh, in the very 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 limited sets of situations where there's no energy loss, right? So yes, we can formulate Bernoulli in this per unit mass formulation, but the main limitations, the main limitations of Bernoulli, even, even in this per unit mass form, is that it assumes no energy loss. And like, you know, let's be real guys, um, how often in systems, particularly in bio systems, do we have no energy loss? That's not going to happen that much, right? So yeah, I taught you Bernoulli because it was sort of the simple thing and you know everyone talks about Bernoulli as one of the most fundamental equations in fluid mechanics, but it's super restricted in its use because there's no energy losses. So what do we need? We need a version, you know, perhaps a modified version of Bernoulli that has uh, one or more terms that account for energy loss. So that's what we're going to do when we talk about this more elaborate version of conservation of energy. So it's still going to revolve a, uh, involve a set of assumptions, in particular isothermal, steady state, single inlet, and single outlet. Um, and uh, but it will but it will be um, but it will at least allow for the uh, energy loss, uh, particularly in this viscous loss term. But while we're at it, we might as well also add in um, some additional complexity right here. So let's move ahead. I'll put down the equation for this term, which will involve these um, these new terms that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. So, 
So isothermal, what do we, so first I'm going to talk about the assumptions that go into this new version of conservation of energy. So first I'm going to talk about isothermal in the sense that, you know, um, we're not uh, considering energy associated with heat transfer. Right, so strictly speaking, you know, if I'm talking about, you know, uh, if, if we talked here, you know, this term, this, you know, this Bernoulli equation and even this equation here, you know, really just talked about kinetic energy and potential energy. We all know that for real thermal energy is yet another form of energy. But if we assume our system is isothermal, i.e. that there's negligible temperature variations, So if we have negligible temperature variations, then you know, then we do basically don't need to worry about thermal energy entering and exiting our system or changing, you know, uh, you know, changing forms in terms of kinetic or potential energy. Right. So you know, in real life, we know temperature varies, but if we assume isothermal, you know, then you know, we know it. We know hypothetically it could vary, but we're considering its contributions to change in energy negligible. So, uh, so there we have it. Um, our, this form of conservation of energy is also going to be in steady state. And we know that, you know, in general, we have our, when we're doing conservation of stuff, we have accumulation equals ins minus outs plus, plus generation. Um, we're basically only going to be talking in, in, in this part of the class for fluids. We're really only going to be talking about um, systems in steady state. And in steady state, you know, we basically have some some system energy. You know, things could be coming in and going out and changing their energy in the process of doing so. But if we're at steady state, we don't consider the case where somehow we have a system that's like storing up a bunch of kinetic energy in the fluid or expending some stored kinetic energy of the fluid or something like that. You know, we're basically, we're not, we're not considering this accumulation uh, term right here. Um, so in steady state, this accumulation, you know, this would basically have that time derivative of something in it, and if we're considering our system to be in steady state, any time derivatives are going to be zero. So we're basically this this version of the equation that I'm about to put down um, is basically just going to be a balance of ins, outs, and generation. Um, finally, um, we're going to consider a single a single input, single output. A single input, single output system, and uh, so single out, single input, single output system. You know, hypothetically, we could have some situation, you know, where we have like let's say a Y junction like this, and we have you know fluid with some kinetic energy coming in here, some different kinetic energy coming in here. You know, how, like how would how would um, you know how would coming how would the stuff coming out you know vary as a function of these inputs? Um, you know, it's it's not totally far-fetched to, to come across these types of systems in fluid mechanics, but um, for simplicity and really just trying to demonstrate the concepts involved, um, where we're only going to consider cases where we have just a single input and a single output involved um, and, and sort of neglect these more complicated, you know, branches or networks or things like that. Um, you know, it will, it, will be po it will be possible later on. We'll sort of take a, take a, a, a revised look at multiple inputs and multiple outputs um, uh, in a different context, but for now, let's not worry about, let's not worry about multiple inputs or multiple outputs. Um, and so if we make these three, with these three assumptions, isothermal, steady state, and single input, single output, then we can come up with essentially um, equa an equation that I call, that I'll call engineering engineering Bernoulli, uh, which you could call steady, which you could equivalently call steady state conservation of steady state conservation of energy. So here it is. Right, so it's, uh, it has a couple of new terms and I'll define them after I write down the equation.
So it's capital W subscript S, uh, or capital W dot with a subscript S divided by lowercase w plus capital E with a hat on it and a subscript V is equal to one half and parentheses side brackets V in cubed and the cube is within the bracket divided by bracket V in minus bracket V out cube within the bracket divided by bracket V out uh, plus G times H in minus H out plus 1 over rho times 1 over rho times P in minus P out. All right, so we, we notice we have some familiar stuff over here, some kind of familiar stuff right here, although it looks a little goofy, and then some brand new terms right here. So let's define, let's define some of our, our new terms. Well, um, anything with a subscript in means it's associated with the inlet. So subscript in, This means um, at the inlet, any subscript out, you could guess would mean we're at, uh, at the outlet. Um, let's define all the easy stuff first. Rho is, of course, the mass density, mass densities of the fluids. P is pressure. So in this case, pressure at the inlet or pressure at the outlet. Rho is, of course, density. G is the gravitational acceleration. So 9.81 meters per second squared. H's are the, um, the Z heights. So this, so in uh, in a sense, this is the this is the sort of potential energy term right here. So h is going to be our z height. Um, now let's let's uh, we'll deal with these brackets in just a minute. Um, so what a bracket? So we'll deal with these brackets now. So a bracket of something. So a bracket of let's say whatever, what a bracket of something, you know, this, this brackets ting is, is essentially a spatial average. Um, is a spatial average uh, across the control volume. So, and, and I'll clarify in just a second what, what exactly that means uh, for, for, these, uh, for these inlets and outlets. So I'll, I'll do so on the next page in just a second, but, but these brackets are there. Um, these are velocities, are fluid velocities. Fluid velocity. And then uh, this E hat sub V is a new term. And I'll call it the viscous loss Per unit mass, and what what this viscous loss per unit mass means is basically if I had some system, let's say a long pipe, and I had some fluid going in, and you know eventually that you know a, that same amount of fluid would have to come out the other end. If I had to force a kilogram of fluid through this system at the particular velocities that all the fluids are going, you know, and, and with all the viscous effects and turbulence that's going on inside this tube, you know, if I had to force one kilogram of fluid through that, how many joules would that take? So in a sense, it's basically how many joules So how many kilograms or how many joules 
of energy to force one kilogram of fluid through our system uh, through our system basically as as all of the rest of the fluid is flowing through and that's this e hat sub v term um, the little w is the mass flow rate which would have units of kilograms per second and this big w dot s is what's called the shaft work uh, so um, so let me further further define here All right so if you put a dot if you put a dot on top of something then it's the shaft the the shaft work rate so w sub s dot is the which you can basically say is equal to um, the power of of any turbines in our system minus the power of any so the power of any turbines minus the power of any pumps so this is the turbines of things extracting energy from the fluid and the power of any pumps putting energy in. So uh, a shaft work rate would of course, uh, this would have units of watts, units of watts or joules per second. Um, so, so there we have it. Okay, so this, this is defined a lot of terms. Again, I'm going to uh, elaborate in just a second on what this spatial average means. But, uh, but now, but as you can see, this is similar in many ways to the, to the per unit mass version of Bernoulli that we had before. We just have a couple new terms on the left hand side and a slightly different formulation of what's going on with these velocities right here. So what's the deal with these brackety V in cubed bracket over bracket V in terms? What, what do the brackets mean? Why is it bracket V in cubed over V in? And how does that relate to the analogous term in the energy per unit mass version of Bernoulli, right? So how do we get, you know, what is the relationship between, between these things? What do these brackets mean? Let's go that way. So, bracket of some quantity basically means that under some circumstances whatever this quantity is could vary over the inlet or outlet so we need to average it Over, over the inlet or outlet, right? So let's say I have a pipe, right? We all know that, um, uh, and we'll end up proving later on in this class that if you have a pipe and there's laminar flow within that pipe, if the pipe is circular, you end up with this parabolic velocity profile. So let's say I had a system and I'm calling, you know, somewhere in the middle of this pipe my inlet, well, there's not one single velocity that really describes this. And um, as we solved earlier in a momentum problem, the, uh, the average velocity squared is not the same as the average of the velocity squared. And it turns out that a similar thing follows, uh, follows for the cubes too. So what does it mean? It basically, if I have this inlet here and you imagined breaking it up, into a whole bunch of little chunks where we said, you know, each little chunk has some kinetic energy flow rate coming in. Um, well, that kinetic energy flow rate is proportional to the kinetic energy per unit mass, which would basically be one half rho v squared of whatever this point was right here. 
times whatever mass flow rate is flowing through it. So you basically need another factor of velocity. So that's where that's where we get this v cubed from. And then basically what you need to do is average that over all of the inlet thing, and then divide by the mass flow rate, which is basically this rho times v. And then so we basically need to like kind of integrate these quantities over over these surfaces. So let me formalize this definition. If I have a bracket of a thing, then that's basically equal to um, an integral over the area of the inlet or the outlet times the thing dA over the area of the inlet or outlet. So, um, so, so that's 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 what this bracketed quantity means. So it's essentially like a spatial average. So I basically take this thing, you know, integrate it over the whole area of this, and then if I divide that by the area of the surface, that essentially gives an averaged over the surface. And basically, because the kinetic energy per unit mass is one half rho v squared, um, the kinetic energy flux is through, or the kinetic energy flow rate through the surface sort of gets another factor of velocity. Anyway, the details. Um, I think are really beyond what I'm attempting to kind of cover in this class, but we basically need to do this bracketed integration operation for V cubed and then divide it by the mass flow rate. So this gives us essentially the, the kinetic energy per unit mass that's flowing into our system. What's the key simplification that we can make here? Uh, the key simplification that we can make here is for uniform flow For uniform flow, bracket V in cubed over bracket V in is basically equal to um, is just equal to V in V in squared. That basically you can imagine like if these velocities are uniform, then you can essentially pull them out of the integrals, and then the v cubed cancels with the v in the denominator. So you just get v squared, and the rest and the rest of it cancels as well. So um, I like to have this form here and sort of very broadly explain what this brackety business means. Um, I don't think there's a single problem in the rest of this class where you're actually going to need to use this, use this bracketed form. But if you were ever to want to apply some of these concepts outside of class and you perhaps ran into a problem where you had a non-uniform flow and was worried about this thing, um, then you would need to cancel it in. So for uniform flow, it, it cancels out and you get just v squared. Um, or I guess um, some other some other, we might run across a problem in this class where we, na where we have non-uniform flow, but if your outlet is the same as your inlet, then these cancel out. So basically, the two types of problems we'll run into in this class are the cases where we have uniform flow, in which case you can make this simplification, or the inlets and the outlets happen to be the same. So even if they're not uniform, you don't actually need to um, worry about the difference. This whole, term, the, this whole term will cancel out if the inlets, if the kinetic energy essentially flowing in and the kinetic energy flowing out is the same. So that's the key takeaway. So for uniform flow, do, 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 um, if inlet profile is same as outlet, um, you know, the this bracketed business cancels. So that, that's the key takeaway here. So my, my apologies for sort of introducing a somewhat complicated term, not very thoroughly explaining it, um, and then just showing a couple of shortcuts, but Again, this is the world we live in. Let's move on. All right, so there's this modification for non-uniform velocity profiles, although in reality, we won't end up really using it that much. Um, now let's talk about, uh, about shaft work. So imagine I had a system where, let's say I had some pipe coming in, and then I had a pump. And then I had some flow going out, right? So if I had some, you know, some flow going in, some flow going out, and this pump was here, you know, churning away and trying to pump that fluid, you know, generally I would have basically some 
let's say low pressure on this side and some high pressure you know usually that the outlet of the pump is kind of at a higher pressure that pump sort of pressurizes things so you know if I look at you know if I look at this equation here you know my inlets and outlets would be the same those would cancel if it's horizontal these cancel um, and you know just over the small scale of the pump I'm not going to have any appreciable viscous losses so basically you know in this type of system it's basically the the work from the pump creates this pressure difference so um, but you can imagine the fluid mechanics of what's going on in this pump can be super messy, right? You know, sometimes I have pistons, sometimes I have like little spinny fan blade type things, you know, sometimes I have impellers. The fluid mechanics of these things is super, super duper complicated a lot of the times. And a lot of times we don't actually re need to worry about all of the details of this pump. I can just imagine it as kind of a black box that I have some electricity flowing into you know, some electrons flowing in and some electrons flowing out, and I'm essentially just dumping energy into this, right? So a lot of times we're not worried about all the details of all the fluid mechanics of all this pump business. I'm basically just saying, hey, you know, some fluid comes in, the pump, you know, gives it more energy, and then it leaves, you know, then that fluid leaves um, with more, you know, kinetic energy or more pressure or, you know, more something else um, than, it, than it came in with, right? So. Um, so in this sense, you know, I'm not worried about all the details of what's going on with this pump. I just sort of lump that pump uh, as basically a sort of energy adder. And since all of the, since it was convenient for all of these other terms to sort of describe them as a per unit mass basis, you know, if I essentially have some power going into the pump, you know, we talk about electrical power usually in watts or in joules per second. If I have some power going into the uh, into the pump, you know that's basically this W. Uh, let's say W dot pump. You know I have some power that essentially some external power that goes into the pump. Um, each of these terms in these equations we described as on a per unit mass basis. So if I take the joules per second in this pump and divide it by the mass flow rate, which I'll call a little W dot. If I take joules per second and essentially divide it by kilograms per second, then I get joules per kilogram, making it consistent with the rest of the terms in this equation. So, um, and if you wanted to uh, further to further clarify what I mean by mass flow rate, this little w, you can essentially you know get a mass flow rate. You can essentially make that as a volumetric flow rate times times density or alternatively you could express that as um, like an average velocity times a cross-sectional area times a density So you know, essentially, all of these all of these things are sort of equivalent here. So uh, you know, so so why did we bother sort of you know why didn't we bother just putting this as like a single term? Well, a lot of times when you when you're specking out pumps, you know, if you're choosing to buy a pump for your system, you know, they'll tell you sort of what the max power of the pump is in watts or in joules per second, right? So and if you have an anticipated mass flow rate for your problem, you know, that's what. It, but you know, very rarely, like it doesn't really make sense for a lot of these pumping systems you know since the mass flow rate is um, sort of specific to your particular application um, you know uh, pump pump manufacturers don't really express pumps in terms of this whole quantity they're just expressing it in terms of in terms of that numerator right there all right um, and then just just a clarification on signs. Um, so here's uh, so this this w dot s kind of comes from uh, it's 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 notation, it's nomenclature, and it's sort of convention comes from civil engineering where you might have like a dam with some like you know hydraulic system that basically comes through and like feeds out of a turbine, and you're looking to extract energy from that system. So you know you sort of like 
you stick like an actual physical shaft that is attached to a turbine that rotates and you're looking to extract energy from that shaft. So this W dot S is, is an extracted is an extracted energy per unit mass. Um, so, you know, so I use the example of a pump because in most bioengineering systems, we're looking to input energy into our system to get that fluid to move. Um, so even though, so this is basically by definition in an energy out sort of term, um, but you can basically just say, you know, if I have a system with one pump, then my W dot S it's essentially, I can, and I can sort of say this, this work output from my system is equivalent to minus whatever the, the power of my pump, pump is. Because essentially, like, you know, if you're viewing a pump as an input, an input is essentially just a negative output, right? Or a negative input is an equal to an output. So, you know, a lot of times you'll encounter systems, you know, most systems that, that you probably will experience in your bioengineering career will be pumps. Um, but you can use this equation just as well with pumps where you basically say, hey, you know, the shaft work for my system is just what is just the negative of whatever power my pump is consuming, right? Where pumps are taking in power, whereas this, this equation is formulated as if we were extracting power from the system. All right, so thus concludes our discussion of this shaft work term. So now let's talk about what this viscous loss term is uh, and kind of how it incorporates this idea of like turbulence and viscosity and friction and all that stuff. So what do I mean when I'm talking about this viscous loss term? Well, let's pull let's pull the equation uh, let's pull the equation the sheet with the equation back out. I'm talking about this term right here. So so there we are. What what is this e hat v? This energy per unit mass that's sort of lost um, with um, with sort of friction-like or viscous effects. So imagine I had a tube, and I have some little packet of fluid that I'm pushing into the tube. If if I if I wanted to force that fluid through the tube, you know, we we talked about how you know due to viscosity and all that stuff, you know, there's there are velocity gradients that exist inside a tube. And sometimes there's turbulence, there's sort of swirling eddies and all that stuff. Basically, the shear stress from the surrounding fluid sort of pulls back on any, any fluid you try to pump through a tube, the surrounding fluid kind of pulls back due to friction, due to viscous effects. And it takes energy to basically, you know, have some tube and push it all the way through to the end. You know, basically because the adjacent fluid was pulling back on that fluid the whole time, it was applying force over that whole distance that you had to push that fluid through the tube, right? So you basically had to dump a whole ton of energy just to get that fluid from one end of the tube to the other, even if it entered and left with the same velocity. You know, it took energy to sort of push it through that tube along the whole way. And every chunk of mass that goes through the tube requires that amount of energy to basically push it out through. So there's this viscous loss term that, that kind of accounts for that energy loss. So let's explore it a little bit further. So take a moment now, pause and ponder. What are some, you know, let's just imagine I had a tube like this and I'm, and I'm pushing chunks of fluid through it. What factors um, do we expect the viscous losses per unit mass to depend on for fluid flow uh, through tubes? You know, so this might, for example, be like geometrical factors. Right, like like some some things relating to the geometry of the tube, um, properties of the fluid, other stuff. 
All right, so what, what, what sort of factors do we expect these viscous losses to depend on? So take a moment now, pause and ponder, you know, what, what do you expect? You know, what do you expect this sort of, the energy dissipation of pumping fluids through tubes? What, what might you expect it depends on? All right, well, hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder. Let's talk about some of them. So something that's actually not really geometrical or a property of the fluid, uh, one of the most important factors is actually the average velocity. All right, so um, if any of you have ever tried to, um, you know, have a really long straw, like those, uh, like curly Q straws, um, and you try to, you know, if you try to suck fluid up through the straw at a normal rate, you know, it's okay. But if you try to force fluid really, really fast through those flaws, it's actually pretty hard. Um, so it takes, it t you know, it takes a lot more of your energy to do that. So the average velocity of the fluid uh, plays a role. You know, um, and if the fluid's moving really slowly, we expect that you know any velocity gradients that exist within the fluid are going to be are going to be less, right? So you know, basically, the lower the velocities, the less shear stress is going to be pulling on that fluid as we try to push it through the tube. So, average velocity plays plays a role. So, what else might it depend on? Well, unsurprisingly, it depends on the fluid viscosity. Right, so, you know, if you were trying to force air through the tube, you would probably encounter a heck of a lot less friction than if you were trying to force honey through that tube. So the fluid viscosity uh, makes a lot of difference as well in terms of how much friction we anticipate um, existing, right? So, you know, um, so we might talk about that. Uh, it turns out that the fluid density The, that the fluid density also matters. Um, and it turns out it's sort of through an indirect way that basically, if you remember back in the very, very first lecture, um, density played a factor in the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number helps us determine about, uh, helps to determine whether fluid is laminar or turbulent. And you can imagine whether flow is laminar or turbulent in this tube makes a big difference about how much energy is dissipated, right? Turbulence basically causes these chaotic swirls and all that stuff, and that could lead to a lot more energy dissipation. So basically, uh, density plays a role, not quite as directly or intuitively as viscosity might, but it turns out to be pretty important because turbulence is important in terms of this energy dissipation. The length of the tube. The length of the tube, L, matters. So back to the curly Q straw example, if you have one of those really, really, really long straws, you know, that go and you try to suck fluid up through, you know, you might have encountered that it's, it's a lot harder to drink out of one of those straws than just the normal, you know, short straws that you encounter in your everyday life, right? So if you double the length of the tube, give or take a little bit, that's going to double the amount of energy that, uh, that it's going to requ require to pass the fluid through that, you know. Um, work is force times distance, so you're dragging that fluid through twice as much distance of tubing. So length of the tube is going to matter a lot in terms of how much energy it's going to dissipate when it goes from the inlet to the outlet. Finally, the, the last major factor that plays a role, um, the last sort of most important factor that plays a role in energy dissipation is the diameter of the tube. So the diameter of the tube. Actually, I'll, I'll give it a lowercase d just to make it consistent with my, my other notes, right? So let's say, you know, if we have a really, really narrow tube, just some tiny little capillary, um, you know, passing passing all of this mass, mass through a tiny little capillary, it's going to dissipate a whole lot more energy than, uh, than with a nice big tube here, right? So we experience this. Um, we experience this a lot. So, um, you know, in our in our everyday lives, you know, if I were to install plumbing in my house, I would want to make sure that the diameters of the tubes were big enough such that I still had decent water pressure once the water made it to my shower head um, or my sink or my you know any of my other appliances, something like that, right? So these these I would say are the most important 
these are the most important factors in, in determining this viscous loss term. Uh, it turns out there are other, a couple of other factors that do make, that do make a bit difference, sort of in special cases. Um, so some others. So some other factors that turns out to importance. If, if we have non-circular, If we have non-circular tubes, let's say you know some oval or something like that, you might be important. It might be important, um, you know, um, if you know if I had some some weird tube that was non-circular, you know, it might be important to know what you know the major diameter versus the minor diameter is for those tubes, and you know both of those both of these geometrical factors would play a role. In, um, in frictional losses. And it turns out um, for turbulent flows in relatively big tubes, the roughness the roughness of the tube wall makes a difference, right? So for example, let's say I had some tube, but this tube had a bunch of junk accumulated in the edges of it. Um, the, all the junk that accumulates in the edge of the tube uh, Pl plays a role because basically this roughness can cause can sort of instigate or perpetuate turbulence forming and that turbulence can lead to additional um, friction within the flow uh, and it turns out that you can basically characterize roughness with sort of whatever length scale exists in this so the roughness of the tube wall is oftentimes given given the value lowercase k um, and it has units of meters, I guess, or, or microns, you know, depending on how, how intense the roughness is. Um, this is important because a lot of times in plumbing um, or in, you know, um, really nasty bioreactors, you sometimes get scale that builds up on the tubes and that scale can sort of uh, lead to a factor like this. And even sometimes in physiological flows, you know, if you have plaques that grow on the insides of your arteries and things like that, um, you know, most importantly, those plaques affect the diameter of your tube, but they can also play a role in roughness as well. So, um, so these are all of the factors. So our viscous losses is a function of all this. Is a function of all this stuff. Yikes. So it's a function of at least one, two, three, four, five, and prob and potentially a few other variables. Ah, don't panic. We'll tackle it together. So what does this function look like? Well, let's let's sketch it out. For flow through tubes. For flow through tubes. The viscous loss term looks like this. It looks like four lowercase f, which I'll define in just a second, times L over D sub H, and I'll define what this sub H means in just a second, times one half average velocity squared. So what is this f? Well, first, pause and ponder. What are the units? What are the units of f? Well, hopefully we've had a chance to pause and ponder. Um, if you look back at the, the previous equation, we know that this viscous loss term has to have units of meters squared per second squared, right? It's an energy per unit mass. Um, and we talked about earlier in the lecture what the units of sort of all of the terms in this conservation of energy equation need to have. So this has got to equal whatever units F has. L um, is units of meters. D is what I'll call the hydraulic diameter. And I'll clarify in just a, in, in just a sec. But it's a diameter all the same, and it has units of meters. And then uh, one half, of course, is unitless. And then velocity squared 
is going to be meters squared per second squared. So, uh, so what do we conclude f has to have? It has to be unitless. All right. So we so so we use this this rationale to conclude that f is unitless. Um, and so what is f? It's called the Fanning friction. It's called the Fanning the Fanning friction factor. And what what is the Fanning friction factor? You know, how does it show up um, in all of our stuff? Well, it turns out that you know this is a pretty this is a pretty a pretty messy function, but you know because it's a function of sort of all of these variables. So we, we basically include the dependence of some of the important variables here. Some of the variables, sorry. We include the dependence of some of the of viscous viscous losses on some of the some of the variables here. And F counts for the dependence on the rest of the variables. So the rest of them make a behind the scenes appearance in here. So rest of variables appear here. So the rest of the variables make an appearance inside of this 4f term. Um, or I guess maybe inside f more precisely. So for, uh, viscous losses is going to be a function of all of this stuff. Some of the dependence shows up here, and the rest of these variables will show up behind the scenes when we talk about this f. This f turns out to be uh, turns out to be unitless. So, it's so this Fanning friction factor um, is going to be a function of, of of a bunch of stuff. So this friction factor is a function of it turns out to, to be a function of velocity. Even though velocity already shows up in viscous losses, the f also secretly depends on average velocity as well. Hydraulic diameter, length, density, viscosity, and potentially the, the roughness as well. All right, so let's start exploring a little bit what, what the forms of this, of this little f function might be. Oh, but before I get too far, I promised, I made a promise that I, that I haven't yet kept. I promised I would talk about hydraulic diameter a little bit before we get too deep, right? So hydra hydraulic diameter shows up here, it shows up here, but I promised I would talk about it, and I haven't. So let's put a little side box over here. So hydraulic diameter, d sub h, is defined as the following. It is defined as... 4 times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. So basically hydraulic diameter, you know, takes the idea the idea of the diameter of a pipe but extends it to potentially non-circular cross-sections. So, you know, Hypothetically, you know, if you're doing microfluidics, a lot of times you, you end up with like square or rectangular channels, basically due to the manufacturing method for sort of sinking channels into silicon or, or polymer chips, you know, things like that. Um, or, you know, we know that a lot of um, physiological arteries and things are maybe like ovals instead of circles or things like that. So take a moment now pause and ponder what is the hydraulic diameter for a for a circular tube all right well hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder so the hydraulic diameter is equal to Four times the cross-sectional area. Well, the cross-sectional area of a circle is pi over four times d squared, and the perimeter of a circle is pi d. 
So if we notice, pi's cancel, 4's cancel, squared cancels with the d in the denominator, and we just get d. So that's why this that's where this factor of 4 comes from. This factor of 4 basically comes from the way to make the it, it enforces that the hydraulic diameter will be the actual diameter for a circular tube, but it's still something that can make, can make sense and be defined even for non-circular cross-sections. So that's the, that's the hydraulic diameter. So for many, 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 many problems that we'll use in this class, you, um, we'll be dealing with circular pipes because um, they're you know, the simplest and can lead to, to the, you know, the best intuitions and also are sort of the most common that you'll come across in biofluids. So, you know, most of the time, you know, you'll see this D sub H and you'll be like, well, I'm dealing with circular pipes, so I'm just gonna use diameter straight up. All right, so aside complete, let's go back to talking about this friction factor. So we have this friction factor and uh, it turns out that you know, I describe this friction factor as being a function of all of these things, but there's not a one size. There's not going to be some one size fits all function that works for all possible combinations of all of these input variables here. There's, it's just, it's just. I mean, maybe hypothetically we could derive one from first principles for the physical laws of nature, but it would be way too messy to have a real sensible engineering use. So a lot of times when there's some function like this, we can kind of break it up into a couple functions for different regimes, for different types of flows, where, um, you know, where one function is a pretty good approximation for one type of flow, and another approximation is gonna be a pretty good function for another type of flow. And if we think about fluid mechanics, flow through pipes and things like that, the two main ways that we, or the two main types of flow that we'll encounter, you know, or that makes sense to, uh, to break it up are basically for laminar versus turbulent flow. So there's this function here, and instead of having this some single function that applies for both laminar and turbulent flows, let's break it up. Let's cover uh, let's cover it into two separate uh, two separate cases. So we'll have two separate functions: one that works for laminar flows, one that works for turbulent flows. But in order to know whether we're whether we're dealing with a laminar or a turbulent flow, we need to check out the, well, what number determines whether the flow is laminar or turbulent? The Reynolds number determines it. So the Reynolds number helps us determine whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. Oftentimes when we have a Reynolds number, we give it a subscript. Um, we give it a, a subscript based to define what length scale it's based on. And I'm gonna give the subscript a subscript just to say that we're using hydro the Reynolds number based on the hydraulic diameter for the flow. And if you dust all the way back to your first lecture, lecture notes, the Reynolds number is defined as rho v d over mu. So, um, so if we're thinking about Reynolds number, um, what flows are associated with uh, high Reynolds numbers? So, let's say we have a high. Let's say we have a high Reynolds number. Are we dealing with laminar flows or are we dealing with turbulent flows in that case? So pause and ponder. All right, so hopefully you've paused and pondered. High Reynolds number is associated with, with turbulent flows. So what does this mean? If you wanted to calculate the viscous losses, you're going to need this friction factor. If you're going to need to calculate this friction factor, there's not some one size function, some one size fits all function that's going to allow us to calculate the friction factor. We're instead going to need to know whether we'll use one form of the function for laminar flows and one form of the function for turbulent flows. Um, and to determine whether we have a laminar or a turbulent flow, you're going to need to calculate the Reynolds number. I told you that high Reynolds numbers are, turb are turbulent and low Reynolds numbers are laminar, but you know how high is high? How low is low? You might, you might want a sort of hard and fast rule to help you deal, uh, deal with this. So it turns out that flows are laminar, 
So flow in tubes. Flow in tubes are laminar when when the Reynolds number is less than 2200 and turbulent when Reynolds number is greater than 4000. So pause and ponder. Is there some problem with this formulation that I have here? Well, yes. <laughs> what if I'm in between these two? Well, it turns out that flows are very difficult to predict whether they're going to be laminar or, per or turbulent if they're in the mid-range. So it's difficult to predict if, um, if they're in between 2,200 and 4,000. So from an engineering perspective, this is disastrous, right? Um, you know, we wouldn't know which which friction factor function function to use um, if the flows are between these two, and and that you know that can lead to huge uh, that can lead to huge problems, right? You know, we could get very unpredictable system behavior if we thought it was going to be laminar, but it turned out to actually be turbulent because we were in this very unpredictable range. It turns out that if um, not this isn't flow through tubes, but it's a similar phenomenon. If you've ever flown in airplanes, you might have noticed that you know if this is sort of the so the cross section of an airplane wing, you'll notice these sort of little nubs um, at the at the leading edge of an airplane wing right here, and it turns out that that is basically to make to force the flow over the airplane wing to be turbulent, and. You know, you might be like, hey, wait, why would I want to force the flow to be turbulent? Well, it turns out that when an airplane is taking off right around the speed that the airplane would choose to leave the ground, the flow over the wing is kind of in an unpredictable re regime like this. And from, an, you know, from a pilot's perspective, the amount of lift the wing provides is very different whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. So they basically put these little nubs here to force the flow to be turbulent so the, so the behavior of the airplane is very predictable. Um, so the next time you're on an airplane, you might be able to look, look out and you'll see these little turbulating nubs. Um, on the on the leading edge of the wings and they put them there intentionally to basically force the flow over the wing to be turbulent so the pilots can have predictable behavior um, from the airplane particularly particularly at that critical moment when the airplane is about to take off and avoid these sort of awkward things so what's the key takeaway for you well if you're an engineer and you're trying to design some system you would want to avoid this regime for flow within pipes. You know, if you're designing some, you know, some bioreactor or some, you know, coolant system or something like that, or you're trying to flow through flow, uh, flow fluid through pipes, you'd want to avoid this this regime of Reynolds numbers so you don't get unpredictable system behavior. All right, so I told you that we would have two separate functions, one for laminar and one for turbulent, for flow through for flow through tubes. So why don't I why don't I put it down here for uh, for turbulent flow or actually no I'll give you laminar flow first. For laminar flow for laminar flow in a circular tube uh, the friction factor, I'll give you 4F, is equal to 64 over the Reynolds number. Um, or just F by itself would then be equal to 16 over the Reynolds number. And that's a Reynolds number based on D sub H. So, uh, so how is this helpful? Well, if you knew the Reynolds number, you could plug that in to here to get 4F. You could then plug 4F into this equation here to get the viscous losses. And the viscous losses you could then plug into your conservation of energy equation. And you could basically get some equation, for example, that relates fluid velocities. Velocity would appear both in this and maybe in here to, uh, to pressures, you know, or heights or things like that. Something like that. So 
basically this this conservation of energy equation is basically a way to relate flow velocities to pressures. You know, for example, like if I forced fluid through a tube at some pressure, what velocities might arise? You know, this is a way to sort of get one equation that kind of relates pressures and velocities. And if the flow if the flow through the tube is laminar, we have a relatively simple equation to use for this friction factor. Sorry, that's not 4f. That's just a single f, right? If I divide both sides by 4, I get I get this right-hand side. So for laminar flow, um, this friction factor, this a function for this friction factor actually is pretty straightforward. It's just 16 over Reynolds number. For turbulent flow in a circular in a circular tube, it's a slightly more complicated relationship. Um, we end up with two two situations. One, if the tube is smooth. Um, i.e. negligible k. Remember k was our uh, was our was the length scale of the friction. So basically if your k over d is really small, um, then you end up with this equation for f is equal to 0 0.316. Uh, Reynolds number based on d to the minus one fourth, and this applies if Reynolds number is in this regime of four thousand, is greater than four thousand but less than ten to the fifth. So a pretty broad range of turbulent Reynolds numbers there. Um, for uh, but this only applies if the tube is smooth. If you have turbulent flow in a rough pipe, then you'll need to use what's called the, the Moody diagram. Which is in uh, page 204 uh, of, of the textbook that we're using for this class. Um, and this and this Moody diagram is essentially a plot of 4f versus Reynolds number, and it has kind of a family of curves for different for different roughnesses. So they basically have this family of curves where each curve has a different each curve have a, has a different roughness in relation to the diameter of the tube. So you can basically, um, you know, if you had a Reynolds number, you could use this to calculate a friction factor, or if you had a friction factor, you could use this to calculate what Reynolds number the flow would be at um, for, for a whole bunch of different roughnesses of tubes. So, um, so, and, and I'll do, an, um, I'll, you know, there'll be a homework problem and solutions and, you know, I'll, I'll give further support as to like, how do you, how to use this Moody diagram. One final thought is on, uh, is there are viscous losses, not just, uh, not just for flow through long circular pipes, but But viscous losses can occur in other flow units. Um, so for example, even if uh, beyond just the viscous loss of pumping fluid through a tube, basically if you try to pump fluid around a bend, you sort of get some, you know, get some additional junk happening um, around the corners where you know the flow kind of wants to continue one way. When it rounds the corner, you get some additional swirling that causes some friction losses. Um, if you have a tube that kind of suddenly expands to a larger diameter, the fluid kind of jets through, but it also sort of swirls back on itself a little bit. And those swirls back end up dissipating some extra energy until the flow kind of fully sorts itself out downstream a little bit. You can also get similar um, it's most pronounced in a if flow kind of goes from a small diameter to a big diameter, but you can also get it from big diameter to a small diameter as well.
you can suffer additional fric frictional losses. You can also have viscous losses, for example, if you have a tube, but you have some partially closed valve within that tube, right? Because then you're basically forcing all of that flow to go through a small orifice, right? So, you know, people who design, for example, prosthetic heart valves might care about, care a lot about these viscous losses through partially closed heart valves and things like that. But all of these, you can imagine, are pretty, uh, pretty messy, pretty difficult to model, so we're not actually going to cover, you know, viscous losses exist in more things than just flow through straight circular tubes, but they're, they're a little bit beyond the scope of what we'll cover um, in this course. Um, and then finally, one last note is you might, uh, you might encounter viscosity, um, two different t like types or terminologies for viscosity. So what we've just called viscosity up to this point in the class is mu or eta if you went back to the way beginning of the class. And this has units of force per area, i.e. newtons per, uh, sorry, uh, force, sorry, has units of force per area per, uh, per velocity gradient, which is essentially per one over time. So it's units of force per area per one over time, or newtons per meter squared per one over second, which basically translates to kilograms uh, per meter, per meter second. Um, you might encounter um, a different variable for viscosity, which is Greek letter nu, and this is what's called the kinematic viscosity. The kinematic viscosity, which has units of uh, meters squared per second, and the relationship between these two viscosities is kinematic viscosity is equal to what we've just called viscosity divided by density. And sometimes people call what we've just called viscosity, sometimes people call this the, the dynamic, the dynamic viscosity. So what's the deal, what's, you know, what's the deal with this kinematic viscosity? Well, sometimes um, for a lot of problems, people don't necessarily care to deal with density and viscosity. Like the, it's annoying for them to write up to look up two separate properties of the fluid. Um, and a lot of times they just appear in ratio to one another. So people just lump them together with kinematic viscosity. So for example, if you wanted to calculate the Reynolds number for something, rather than looking up rho, uh, rather than looking up both the density and the viscosity of a fluid, you could just look up what the kinematic viscosity was and and just use that kinematic viscosity in the, den in the denominator alone. Um, I think it's confusing and annoying to have two separate variables for viscosity, but you know, again, I don't rule the world. I don't get to make all these decisions. So I just wanted to make you aware that if you so show up, there's this Greek letter, Greek letter nu, which although it looks like a V is not a velocity um, it's actually a viscosity, and it shows up in the denominator of Reynolds number in some cases. So don't get tripped up by this. All right, so hopefully this was helpful. Um, you can look forward to an example problem in my next lecture. So thanks for watching, and good luck with your studies of fluid mechanics.